I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime, and this is Currents. New York's abortion law may be changing. We'll tell you what it means and the impact it could have. It's the trial of the century, the 16th century, that is. This is the classic thing. Do you compromise yourself for whatever it is in life? And uh, Thomas said no. And local Catholic writers get their creative juices flowing. They see it as another arm of new evangelization, that whole spirit of that. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. Abortion has been at the center of a number of national debates in recent months, but changes may be coming to laws right here in New York. And according to the church, not for the better. The New York State Catholic Conference, the public policy voice for the church of the state, says a proposal introduced in the assembly last week is a, quote, radical abortion bill. The Reproductive Health Act matches the bill already in the state Senate and has the support of Governor Patterson. Well, we wanted to find out more, so I spoke by phone yesterday with the New York State Catholic Conference Director of Pro-Life Activities, Kathleen Gallagher. Well, Kathleen, thank you so much for joining us here on Currents today. We really appreciate your time. Good to be here. Well, we're talking today about the Reproductive Health Act. Tell us, if you will, first of all, exactly what that act would do. Well, this is a bill that was originally proposed by former Governor Spitzer as part of his platform in 2007, um, which would radically alter abortion policy in New York State. Um, in very extreme ways, uh, it would, uh, first of all, allow abortion through all nine months of pregnancy. Right now, on the books in New York, abortion is only legal through 24 weeks of pregnancy. And while that's not enforceable right now because of Supreme Court decisions, should it ever become enforceable, the Reproductive Health Act would wipe that out and say all abortions through the third trimester of pregnancy would be legal and available in New York. Right. Um, so that's one thing that it does. Uh, it does a lot of really awful things. Um, it basically elevates abortion to a fundamental right in New York State, right alongside the right to vote. It's fundamental. It's untouchable. Even the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't say that about abortion. The U.S. Supreme Court says abortion can be regulated. We can have reasonable regulations on abortion, things like parental notification for minors' abortions. We can restrict funding of abortion by state taxpayers. If the Reproductive Health Act were to pass, we could have no reasonable regulation of abortion. It would be untouchable as a fundamental right, and nobody could discriminate against that fundamental right. It would almost be illegal to be pro-life. Uh, well, what is the status of this bill right now in the state legislature? Uh, well, it's been introduced in both houses of the legislature for the first time ever. Um, since 2007, when Elliot Spitzer first uh, proposed the idea, it's only been introduced in the state Senate. Just this week, it was introduced in the state assembly by Assemblywoman Deborah Glick, a uh, Democrat from New York City. Um, so now we have a two-house bill, um, and that gives the bill some legs, so to speak. Um, it makes it uh, somewhat viable. Um, kind of sneaky, I think, that it was just introduced this week, which is the last week of the scheduled legislative session. <laughs> well, one of the groups that has been stepping up in support of this bill is NARAL Pro-Choice New York. Not really a big surprise there. They are a, a pro-choice pro group. They've stepped up in support of this uh, bill. They're urging their supporters to support the bill as well. A couple of things that I'll run by you here that they've been saying and just get your response to them. Sure. Um, they said uh, that, that the bill will, for the first time in, in state law, say that a woman has a right to control her own reproductive health and will actually you know, strengthen state law as far as uh, women making their own health decisions. I get your response to that. And also the fact that they say that three quarters of New Yorkers are in favor of this act even after hearing arguments against it. What do you say to those two things? Um, well, first of all, to, to suggest that a woman in New York State doesn't have the right to control her own body um, or her own health decisions is just laughable. New York State was the first state in the country to legalize abortion in 1970, even before the Roe v. Wade decision in 1973 by the U.S. Supreme Court. Abortion is available. It's accessible. Every time you pass a 
Boston, in the street in New York City, you see another advertisement for abortion. So, so to say that women can't make their own health decisions or abortion decisions here is just silly. That's ludicrous. Um, abortion is legal and available, which just shows you this bill is unnecessary. Mm. Secondly, to the point about, um, I think it was about public opinion favors yes. this. Right. I've seen no polls, uh, public opinion polls, here in New York State on this, except for the ones that NARAL New York has done themselves, and I just wouldn't trust them. The national polls, including Gallup just last month, are all saying that more Americans are pro-life than ever before. That, and so I don't think that most of America would want this bill. Right. Well, do we know where our state legislators stand on the issue right now? Um, well, we certainly know who's supporting it because there are some co-sponsors who are listed on the bill itself so we can see who supports it. Um, and then there's a lot of unknowns, and so we're doing as much advocacy and lobbying as we possibly can right now to stop this bill in its tracks. We're urging all of our state legislators to reject this bill in its current form. It's just a horrible piece of legislation. Right. And what about people, uh, just, just regular uh, voters out there or the, the you know, regular constituents, I guess, out uh, across the state of New York? What is the Catholic Conference asking them to do? Well, we have an alert up on our website. It's nyscatholic.org, O-R-G. Um, we have an alert up there to stop the extreme abortion bill. People can click on that alert on our website and send a message directly to their state senator and assembly person urging them to reject this bill. That's the easiest thing they can do right now. And, and they are listening to the pulse of the people. This is an election year, so lawmakers really care what their constituents think. All right. Well, Kathleen Gallagher, Director of Pro-Life Activities for the New York State Catholic Conference, we really thank you for your time, and uh, we appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Well, the state's legislative session was scheduled to end yesterday, but it's ongoing because of budget talks. We'll bring you the latest on the Reproductive Health Act when it happens. Stay tuned. There's much more current straight ahead. When we return, we'll have the day's headlines, including some other news from the state's capital as the Catholic Church gets an unexpected ally in opposition to no-fault divorce. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. Coming up in just a bit, a word or two about the word. <laughs> but first, let's turn to the day's headlines. A small town in Nebraska is the newest front in the fight over illegal immigration. On the heels of strict new immigration laws in Arizona, voters in Fremont, Nebraska passed a much debated law Monday that would prohibit businesses and landlords from hiring or renting to undocumented immigrants. Supporters say the law is needed because they believe federal law enforcement is not being tough enough. Opponents say while immigration reform is needed, individual cities should not take on the issue. They should be um, legal just like we have to be. I don't think it's right for us to just take it on. I think it should be a government-wide thing. Why are we allowing illegals to be here? If there's laws against illegal and the laws need to be upheld. I think it's sad that it's divisive in our community, and I think it's sad that um, when something that is a national issue comes down to being divisive in a community. Since federal government is not doing anything people have to do something. So you think this will put it to an end? I doubt it. The American Civil Liberties Union says it will sue to stop the law from taking effect. Meantime, Catholic bishops across the U.S. criticized Arizona's new immigration law in recent weeks and called for that law and called for laws that respect the dignity of all people. New York's Catholic leaders have an unlikely ally in the fight against no-fault divorce, the National Organization for Women, also known as NOW. New York is the only state in the union that does not allow for no-fault divorce, but that could change if state lawmakers pass a bill currently under consideration. The president of the New York chapter of NOW says no-fault divorce would push more women and children into poverty. What no-fault divorce will do is it'll say that the treatment that you got in your marriage didn't matter. It's no fault. And we believe that there is fault when there's abuse happening in situations. So we think that no-fault divorce will basically legitimize and rubber stamp the bad decisions that judges are making today. And what we're saying now is that instead of the legislature working to pass no-fault divorce, they should be working 
to hold judges accountable. There should be good laws out there to hold judges accountable, and that's what we would like to see them happen. The New York State Catholic Conference last week called the proposed law fundamentally contrary to the intended meaning and purpose of marriage. A federal judge in New Orleans today blocked a six-month moratorium on deepwater drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. The ruling came a day after Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal appeared in Baton Rouge to pray for the 11 men killed in the Deepwater Horizon oil rig explosion and those impacted by the oil leak. State representatives, senators, and clergy members also prayed at the service in Memorial Hall at the Louisiana State House. Later Monday, Jindal filed a court brief opposing the ban on deepwater drilling. The governor and other opponents say it is not needed and will economically devastate a region that is already reeling. Officials with the Obama administration said they would appeal today's ruling and said the ban is necessary so a thorough safety review can be conducted. Well, meantime, the Obama administration will extend family medical leave benefits to same-sex partners this week. The Labor Department is expected to issue a ruling Wednesday that will allow gays and lesbians to take time off to take care of the uh, sick or newborn children of their partners. The New York Times reports the move is an interpretation of the 1993 Family Medical Leave Act, which allows people who work for companies with 50 or more employees to take up to 12 weeks off without pay to care for children in such situations. President Obama and Vice President Joe Biden, meantime, hosted a reception in honor of LGBT Pride Month today at the White House. A man who says he is the son of the founder of the Legionaries of Christ filed a lawsuit against the Legion in a Connecticut courtroom on Monday. Reports say Jose Raul Gonzalez Lara claims the religious order should have known that uh, Father Marcial Marcial abused children on multiple occasions. The suit seeks more than $15,000 in monetary damages, punitive damages, and what it says are all other appropriate relief. And finally, history uncovered in Rome. The earliest known icons of a few of the apostles were discovered there recently. We get details from Rome Reports. Catacombs are underground tunnels used mainly as cemeteries. Italy has 120 in total, but the Catacomb of St. Tecla contains a particularly interesting discovery. The oldest known representations of St. Andrew, John, and Paul have been found in this catacomb. These icons set the pattern for how the apostles were represented in the following centuries. These frescoes date back to the 4th century and continue to speak to Christians and non-Christians alike in the 21st century. Stay tuned, there's much more Currents coming up. Just ahead, a story about the separation of church and state from centuries ago. He paid dearly for his loyalty to God, a, a, a hero because we don't find many public servants who stand on principle. Welcome back. Well, love, sex, religion, power, plus some of the most famous names in the whole world. All that and more were part of the trial of the century, the 16th century that is. It was the trial that led to the execution of Sir Thomas More, now Saint Thomas More, the patron saint of lawyers. And today is his feast day. Yeah, and he, he may best be known now as the man for all seasons, but one season in particular, the summer of 1535, was his defining moment as his trial unfolded in London. Moore was accused of treason for refusing to accept Henry VIII as head of the Church of England. Well, all that came to life at St. Thomas More Church in Manhattan, which recently hosted a staged reading of the trial. It is July 1st, 1535, and we are gathered here in Westminster Hall for the trial of Sir Thomas More until recently the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the second most powerful person in the realm after His Majesty King Henry VIII. The indictment charged war with high treason under the act of treason concerning the King's supremacy of the English Church. I answer that there is a much greater obligation on the part of a good man and faithful subject to consult his own conscience and eternal salvation. His position as the King's Chancellor was one that was highly coveted and uh, it was usually held by a clergy member from what I understand. 
But Thomas was honored with this position because of his intelligence. This is the classic thing. Do you compromise yourself for whatever it is in life? And uh, Thomas said no. And he knew exactly what the consequences would be, knowing fully well that he would lose his head over it, literally. He was uh, uh, one of the brave Englishmen who stood up to Henry VIII. Uh, and he paid dearly for his loyalty to God, uh, a, a hero because we don't find many public servants uh, today who stand on principle the way Moore did. That's one of the big issues of the church, I think, being able to stand up for what is right. And I wish more politicians today were able to do that. I come from a political family and I'm very proud that we are able to do that. So. Um, I was very interested in, in this. Even though it happened almost 500 years ago, I think it's still relevant. The jury found him guilty. The one single cause is that I have been unwilling over the past years to consent to the second marriage of the king. I have played the role of Margaret, the daughter of St. Thomas More. Do not torment yourself further. This is God's will. Pray to God for the salvation of my soul. He was, as he said, uh, the king's good servant, but God's first. And I think that's a position that we as citizens, we, we as lawyers are, are put in. I mean, how can we be faithful to God's teachings and yet uh, uh, still be good citizens? The Catholic Lawyers Guild reinforces us because we are uh, like-minded. We talk about timely and topical subjects that come up in the legal field. We have a great deal of difficulty with uh, uh, some issues uh, uh, such as abortion and single-sex marriage. And Catholic lawyers have to struggle with how they handle such matters. If, uh, and I'm not going to be a lawyer, but if I'm going to be a good layman and a good husband and a good father, um, what better role model than Sir Thomas More? It's a wonderful exemplification of, of how to live your life and the precepts, the tenets upon which it should be based. Well, it's another great example of not just talking the talk, but walking the walk and really having principles that you are willing to, in this case, you know, give your life for. Right. And, and you know, being able to stand up on those no matter what the cost exactly. And, you know, it's, it's uh, an, an interesting thing because I think we see it over and over again here on Currents that, you know, that there are all of these different groups. Now we've seen lawyers, we've seen healthcare workers in the past and others who combine, you know, their faith and their profession. They're doing something that they love in their profession, but they're also doing it with maybe a little bit of a different uh, perspective than other people who might not be of any particular faith or of a different faith or might not just be focused in that same direction. It, exactly. I think that you never truly take off the one hat of your Catholic faith if you're part of the Catholic Lawyers Guild, for example. Yeah. He said he struggles with things like same-sex marriage or, or the abortion issue. And you can see that that's one of the things that they would as professionals and as Catholics. Yeah. And yet it's those very things that they are willing to try to balance because they want to remain professional and still true to their faith. To be like a, a walking hat rack and wear all right. kinds of hats. You right. Know? <laughs> well, stay with us. We'll be right back. When we return, we'll meet some locals who have the right stuff. The Holy Father urged people working in the arts, do not be afraid to talk of God and to manifest without fear the signs of faith. Well, one well-known book tells us that in the beginning was the Word. Well, tonight we're going to end with the Word, specifically a word or two from Catholic writers. They gathered out at Immaculate Conception Seminary in Huntington, Long Island last weekend for a conference on the Word Made Flesh. And along the way, they offered us some words of wisdom about what it means to write about the church today in all forms of media. This is a, a new adventure, this conference, and there's a lot of quality writing coming out these days on Long Island, in Brooklyn and Queens. We have many people who are engaged in this area and our Catholic newspapers, okay, whether it be the tablet or the Long Island Catholic, are excelling in these areas and trying to educate people, to share with people, and to get them more involved in their faith. Probably the most exciting piece about today is that I see it as another 
arm of new evangelization, that whole spirit of that. I see it as aiding every and all causes in the church. And what we want to do is be able to assist people in making a huge impact with their writing. The Holy Father urged people working in the arts, do not be afraid to talk of God and to manifest without fear the signs of faith, letting the light of Christ shine in the presence of people today. At this gathering, we speak of the might of the pen, which is indeed greater than that of the sword. I haven't met too many Catholic writers who don't really love the church. I mean, there are one or two I kind of suspect, but, but for the most part, I, the Catholic writers I know are all people who are passionately uh, wanting to promote and serve the church and to um, correct a lot of the misperceptions that are out there about the church. I think with a lot of the Catholic writers now are, are, are tired of uh, letting the media uh, explain what the Catholic Church is all about, but and then these uh, these writers, these people that are here today. I mean, mothers and fathers and just regular regular people are just you know they're tired of it and they're just picking up on their computers and, and just uh, writing something. And th there is a following that is growing um, in this in this field. The accessibility of uh, new media has just caused an explosion. There are so many of us raising our children and working jobs and all sorts of other things who can't be full-time writers. And yet you can, if you have a, a computer in your home, you can podcast, you can blog, you can write articles for online magazines. And you may not make very much, you may not make nothing at all, but you can have an impact and really connect with other writers and other Catholics. It's extraordinary the effect that you can have from your home. I see something really exciting happening in Catholic media. I, I think that the Catholic Church has been really slow to, to jump with it, but now between the Pope telling priests to get on the blogs and um, something like Currents and Net New York coming in and doing a daily news show um, and Boston TV doing what it's doing, these are really dynamic and exciting things that are happening in media. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The purpose of all the words, we as individuals, the words we speak and write, is to show forth the splendor of that one great Word, who is Christ. New media, such a big part of our lives, and those are the ones who make it happen in the Catholic world right there. Among them, of course, you saw Elizabeth Scalia, who's uh, the anchoress, uh, the author of the Anchoress blog, very, very well known. You had the, the uh, spokesman there for the Catholic League as well, and just a lot of people who really, their faces you don't see, but their words you might read quite often. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like she was saying in the piece, you can do it right from your home and it gets delivered right to people's homes right. most often. And so you don't have to go out there and buy a book. This is the new media that we're talking about. Right. Obviously, they were representing other media, printed the media, newspaper, right, newspapers, well. magazines, that kind of thing. But the idea that uh, you know you can have your voice be heard and share that and then find other folks that are like-minded yeah. is, is terrific. Yeah. And it's all instantaneous, really. It's so cool. It the new media, you know, takes out the middleman. You don't have to have the thing printed. It just you yep. type it, it's there, and people see it and read it. It's it's cool. And you can tweet it. <laughs> we tweet and yes, we Facebook do. too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is it for tonight. Coming up tomorrow, he was one of the most controversial and famous celebrities in the world, a man who helped define the last century, but he was also a devout Catholic. Who was he? Well, you might be surprised. I will tell you all about him. All right, but in the meantime, remember, you can always catch us online. We're over at CurrentsNY.net. Check out us, check us out on Facebook as well. <laughs> Till next time, I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night.